Roots up a musical alive in Wonderland It's kinda like a giant metaphor for the pandemic And I'm not gonna spoil it But basically I'm setting up a company Locally, theatrically But I'm kinda struggling financially We want to produce our musical this year But firstly for free Here's some stuff about me I'm 20, currently studying at June UC In MT with a level 3 degree In performing arts It isn't too hard But without this chance My career won't kickstart Kickstart or failed And I wanted to apply for an arts council loan But then you came by My friends suggested you'd be a breakout star With help like that You're sure to go far So I wrote this song that I wrote this tune. I'm playing my piano in my own bedroom and I'm hoping you'll give me the chance for my musical dreams to advance. My worries and strife will be done with my future theatre fund. This story starts in a cell. It's a story of how the West's colonial nightmare of Islam came to life. A vision made vision and flesh. So some of this show happens on WhatsApp, which is why I've asked you to leave your phones on and join our WhatsApp group. But look, this show isn't about instant messaging or my love of memes. This show's about men, politics, and the internet. He finds a magazine called De Beer. De Beer makes him dizzy. Inside, he reads these articles that speak to a feeling he's been carrying around for months. That every new outrage, every nightclub attack in Paris or gay bar attacks in the States is part of a plan. A plan that will bring this world that torments and humiliates Muslims, that torments and humiliates him, to its knees. People are very critical of social media, but that's not my experience at all. About 12, maybe 13 months ago, I met um, a gay rabbi from Alabama on Facebook. I mean, let the problems in that man's life just briefly sink in. <laughs> Stale smell of stale teenager staining the air in that comfortable Orange County bedroom. But there's a new president in the White House. One that Ethan and his brothers, well, kind of helped put there. Ethan sends messages, demands translations, links to news aggregators and right-wing news sites. He clicks send. All across Europe, people go to the polls. Muslim against non-Muslim, white against black. Sides are chosen, brotherhoods are chosen. And the gray zone and democracy begin to tumble. Ethan's work finds a waiting, willing audience.
Climate change is the most significant and fastest growing threats to people and their heritage worldwide. So we're losing quite significant parts of our cultural heritage on a daily basis. Sea level rise, the desertification, all adversely impact heritage values. We are just custodians or keepers of these sites. To let our future generation know their past. We need the most advanced techniques to understand these buildings. CIRC uses a variety of technologies to create a highly accurate 3D model that can be used to generate architectural drawings. Entonces, el uso de tecnologías digitales no invasivas permite tener modelos exactos de los sitios, de qué lugares comenzar a abarcar en, en mediano plazo. They can come back in one, three, five years and monitor the erosion down to the millimetric level. The heritage is part of our life. It's part of our identity and it's what defines us. This heritage is the shared heritage of humanity, and we have a duty to protect these sites for future generations. What do you guys want to be when you're older? I want to be a chef. I want to be a scientist. I want to be an actor. Yo, stick to basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Ever let somebody tell you, you can't do something. Yeah, but they're laughing at me. When people can't do something themselves, they're going to laugh. They're going to tell you you can't do something. Forget them. You keep working. You want to be an actor, right? Yeah, but I don't know where to start. You got a phone with a camera, right? Yeah. Well, do your own stuff. Put it online. But I need someone to play other characters. You can play all of them. What about location? Use a green screen. But who will edit all of that? I don't know how to do that. You can learn anything online, man. You know that. There's no excuses. Remember, it's never too late to be all that you could be. I'll come back in the class. <sighs> okay. Part three, scroll down. 
one year before the crash. When the plane touches down in Dubai, Paribash squeezes Hussein's hand. This is her first time outside of Iran. She hasn't slept at all. Hussein wakes up slowly. He knocks the drinks holder with his knee. He's used to coming first class, but he didn't tell his parents this time, just snuck the tickets onto the credit card and came over. Scroll down. The hotel room is huge. Paribash takes a photo of the city skyline, making sure her manicured hand is just in shot. This is it, she thinks. She video calls her sister. She asks if her parents have gone to bed, Daria says they have. She shows Daria the room. Daria can't believe that she's not using a filter. Paradash asks if the liar she told her parents is holding up. Daria says it is. Paradash makes her promise to tell her if they begin to suspect anything. She hangs up and walks downstairs. The valet walks her to the hire car and the automatic door of a yellow Ferrari pops open. She steps in and offers Hussein a swig of champagne. Welcome everyone to the fourth in our series of Cultural Conversations. For those who don't know me, I am William Russell, the 692nd Lord Mayor of the great city of London. And this series is designed to promote the arts and our culture while exploring their power within society. This is of great importance to me and forms a major part of my mayoral theme, Global UK, The New Future, which includes promoting a rich and vibrant culture and the creative economy that supports it. One of our greatest strengths is our arts and is one of the sectors that was deeply affected by the pandemic, which is partly why today's conversation topic, culture, technology and innovation, is such a crucial one. In the last year, the arts have become defined by technology and innovation. For many, it was only via streaming services or exclusive online performances that we experienced any form of culture. And now that the economy and different venues are starting to reopen, many of us are left wondering what role will technology continue to play in the arts? This was a central question for the Culture and Commerce Task Force, which I chaired, as well as our report, Fueling Creative Renewal. Indeed, renewal is a good way of considering the relationship between culture, technology, and innovation. Because there is a great opportunity ahead of, ahead of, of to use technology to shape the arts, whether that's retelling the Shakespearean classics through virtual reality, or encouraging direct audience participation through a performance. But it's not just about reaching new audiences or reaching audiences in new ways. As we emerge from the pandemic, where we have seen the rate of businesses turning digital explode, how cultural institutions use technology and innovation could make them leaders in a diverse and ever-shifting sector. Now, I've only scratched the surface of a very deep and fascinating issue. So thank goodness we have an excellent panel with us today to discuss the intricacies of these issues. Thank you, Javad, Daniel, Sarah, Suhair, and Rich for being part of this discussion. And thank you to Farah for agreeing to chair today's event. And thank you also, a huge thank you, to the Genesis Foundation for your continued support of this series. Now, let's begin. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you hear me. I, I guess you do. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I wanted also to thank the Lord Mayor for his kind introduction. Uh, my name is Farah Nayeri, and I'm a, a journalist for the New York Times. I cover culture uh, here in London. And uh, I'm also an author and a podcast host. Um, uh, the conversation uh, today is uh, is very, very uh, riveting. And I have to say that uh, each one of the speakers will have really a, a great deal of relevant points to make about it. Um, but before I, I get to them, um, I just wanted to, to kind of share with you a very brief introduction. Um, the global coronavirus, excuse me, the global coronavirus epidemic has been an absolute catastrophe, we all, we all agree, for the arts and the culture of this nation and practically every other nation on the face of the earth. We've had um, uh, theaters, opera houses, ballet companies, you know, everyone going dark, the West End's gone dark. Broadway has gone dark. And it's really kind of been, um, we assume, a very, very bleak period. 
I mean, we've all seen, you know, these images of orchestras uh, rehearsing on Zoom and the conductor having an even harder time of keeping them all together and in time. We've seen these pictures of ballerinas um, practicing at home, doing their pirouettes and their plies in their kitchen and using the radiator as a bar. I mean, these are not obviously conditions that any uh, performer ever imagined having to live through. And we have um, someone from the Royal Shakespeare Company, Sarah Ellis, who will be actually talking to us, and also Javad Alipur. They're both, you know, creatures of the stage and they can actually attest to this uh, terrible catastrophe. However, I think uh, one can say that there is a silver lining to the corona cloud. Um, artists, cultural institutions, technology companies, they've all kind of sharpened their tools, their technological tools, to be able to kind of um, communicate with audiences in completely new and inventive ways. And um, they have done that and reached out to existing audiences, but they've also kind of reached out to new audiences. Uh, and so I just um, will turn to my um, panelists in just a moment to explain to you all of those, uh, you know, kind of new and innovative ways in which they have engaged. But before I do, I just wanted to tell a little story. Um, I'm being a cultural journalist, found myself in the same sort of quandary as my fellow panelists about 15 months ago, I guess, those who are in the performing uh, arts uh, and in the visual arts, um, because I didn't have anything to write about. Uh, basically, culture was shut down, it was dead. And so I found myself in a bit of a quandary. And then I realized that the Thessaloniki Festival, uh, documentary festival in Greece, which is a very important festival, had asked 22 filmmakers from around the world, very prominent ones, to make a three minute short in lockdown. In other words, the rules were, the movie had to be three minutes only, and you could not go anywhere outside the confines of your house or the areas that you were allowed to go to in quarantine. So you can imagine that's a pretty confining kind of um, uh, you know, circumstance to, to have to face. And so the um, filmmaker Zha Zhang Ke, who is a you know, Chinese award-winning filmmaker of uh, Still Life and uh, Mountains May Depart, he actually created a, um, a movie in lockdown that kind of had this sort of almost Hitchcock atmosphere, but it was all black and white and it had sort of eerie film music, but um, it was basically kind of a meeting between a member of his team and himself. And they were meeting at his house. So you've got these black and white shots and the eerie music and these, you know, glue kind of, um, as I said, kind of um, scary atmosphere, but th there was nothing scary about it. The real drama came from a coronavirus um, accessories such as, you know, a temperature gun, such as, um, you know, soap and water, washing hands, face masks. And at one point, there was a woman who appeared with a platter, and you expected her to carry teas and biscuits, tea and biscuits, but in fact, it was just a very large bottle of Purell hand sanitizer. So I guess it was his sort of way of, of coping with the pandemic and making the most of it. Um, I would like to turn now to my first panelist, uh, Daniel Birnbaum. Uh, Daniel, if you would care to unmute. Uh, Daniel is the artistic director of Acute Art, which is a, a company uh, that is engaged in uh, producing and cr uh, creating and offering um, virtual reality and AR works, uh, which are wonderful. And you will have seen some of them in the introductory reel. If you didn't see the reel, it will come back at the end. You will see creatures, animated creatures that you can get by holding up your phone against you know, the river, and, and this was an exhibition that Daniel had. So Daniel, tell us, tell us how you managed to actually stay creative and stay engaged, uh, you know, throughout this period. Well, thank you, Farah. Um, yes, um, I mean, once or twice in every century, it seems that something new appears, um, a new visual possibility, a new technology or medium. And um, I think this is something where, I mean, this awareness is something we all share that, you know, there has been photography and there's been cinema and then came the video camera and what else, uh, uh, television, of course, and then the internet. And uh, in our century, there is a new medium or a cluster of new possibilities. And 
What I'm referring to, of course, are virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. Well, a handful of new possibilities that for our engineers, the people I work with are not the same thing, but kind of very closely linked. And, uh, you know, it changes things. It changes what art can be. Um, it changes how art can reach an audience. And it maybe even changes, well, actually, the ontology of an art piece. What is it? Um, and then, you know, in the middle of the lockdown, we actually launched a, a show here in London um, called Unreal City. We staged it together with Dazed Media. It was a low budget, or should I maybe say no budget project. I mean, of course, producing these works are, are um, you know, demanding, but we placed them along the river, uh, along, you know, the South Bank. And, and um, you know, people, the first weeks, people are, at least were allowed to go out. So, they looked at these works, and I think actually a few thousand people saw them. When the app complete lockdown came, we changed the, 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 the project. Some people liked that. Some people thought it was maybe not the most important thing, but we, we turned them interactive, so to say, that you can place these AR objects in your house. Okay. And so that's what we've been working on. So in a okay. way, when most museums in the world were closed, at least we were privileged that we could you know, reach audiences. Yeah, and you told me before you were a curator who actually managed to keep curating. Well, in a way, you know, I curated whatever that means in this medium. I mean, I'm actually a very traditional museum person. And I've been working okay. with the uh, biennales and collections and so on. But yes, we did a similar thing in China and that was curated, if I may, or produced or whatever out of my kitchen in Marlebone. So, you know, in a way, uh, yes, we kept going. Okay. And, um, and, it wasn't maybe a replacement for big, you know, museum shows exactly, but at least compared to everything else, it happened. Yeah, and Sarah, I think, um, Sarah Ellis, you are the director of uh, digital development at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, Sarah, I think that you also, you please do unmute. Um, uh, you know, you also managed to keep going and managed to sort of go into the homes of the audience rather than the audience coming into your house, right? Uh, and th th that's right. Um, the Royal Shakespeare Company um, was leading a project um, funded by UKRI, Innovate UK, that was due to be delivered in Stratford-upon-Avon in person last summer and the pandemic hit and we had to stop production immediately. And, yeah, and, I, and I think, sorry to stop you, but you, you told me that it was to be uh, held in a mini mall. You'd taken over a disused mini mall. We'd was... taken over a disused just disused shop in Stratford upon Avon using yeah. VR and AR headsets and such like. And, 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 and it, as you said, those were very kind of COVID unfriendly, right? VR headset. It was it. probably the most inappropriate project <laughs> to do in a pandemic. That's quite right. But 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 in that moment, and we stopped production and, and we had to really look after our freelancers and our company and people that were there working on the project very abruptly. And we were a we are a consortium of arts organizations, research partners and technology companies. And in that moment, we had to go to our audiences and ask them what they needed at this time. And the research that came back to us quite overwhelmingly was people were craving togetherness, they were craving liveness, but there's a huge digital inequity out there. Yeah, I'm so gonna it, come back to that. That's a very important theme of this discussion that I think everyone on the panel will be able to speak to the digital divide and how you're all trying to bridge it. Um, but before I do, I, I was just gonna uh, go, go down the line and introduce my other panelists. Uh, Rich, uh, could I ask you to unmute? Um, Rich Waterworth, you are the general manager for the UK and the European Union of TikTok. And um, it does seem that the pandemic has been something of an opportunity for TikTok also in terms of audience cultural activity. There's been a lot of active audience, um, you know, participation or use of TikTok during the pandemic, as Hi, we saw Farrah. in some of the clips in the in the reel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Farah. Yeah, thanks, thanks yeah. very much for for having me. And and absolutely, I mean, you know, I think uh, we saw in one of the clips from the reel um, uh, a wonderful young man called Ewan uh, Fellows, who is uh, an aspiring actor, who was. Uh, part of a, a, a program that we got involved with called the Future Theatre Fund. And um, what, what we found with you and, and, and lots of others is that, you know, I think people need, needed, have needed opportunities to express themselves and show their talent and find, 
you know, find ways of, of showing themselves uh, uh, and their talent to the world. Yeah. And of course, you know, when you can't get out of the house and you can't go to theatres and you can't go to auditions, much of that has, has come online, in, including on TikTok. Uh, and so we've, we've had formal programmes like that one uh, called the Future Theatre Fund. But of course, you know, uh, much of TikTok is, is an informal version of that with people expressing themselves you know, in fun ways and, and also some highly talented people expressing themselves creatively, which uh, makes for a really kind of dynamic, exciting environment. And, and, and definitely we've, you know, we've seen that, uh, you know, we've seen that growing over the last year, um, I think, you know, in part because people, you know, people haven't been able to get out. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, that those were the sort of, you uh, got together with Evening Standard, and I think there were some awards that were given to physical performances, but then you also added the TikTok um, Breaking Out Star Award. Yeah. And a few of the people you will see in the reel that comes back on at the end are winners of that yeah. award. Yeah. So, um, so exactly. So we had, we had some awards uh, for uh, trained um, uh, actors, singers, dancers, theater makers, visual uh, designers. But we added this TikTok Breakout Star Award, which um, was for people who haven't had any formal training. Right. Um, and really, that was in recognition of, of the fact that, you know, we absolutely, uh, with the Evening Standard, wanted to support, you know, some of those people who've been through, you know, the drama schools and other um, uh, establishments. We also wanted to recognize that I think there's this whole cohort out there. Uh, with enormous creative talent and ambition, uh, but 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 without necessarily the access or, or, or having been yeah. to those places. So we wanted to try and shine a light on them as well. Yeah, access is a really important thing that I think we're going to definitely come back to uh, very soon in this panel. Uh, so here, could I um, could I ask you, uh, so here you are uh, an executive in the strategic projects division at Google, and of course you're also uh, someone who's very familiar with Google's arts and culture um you know a facility and and uh, which you know has allowed I, I imagine millions and millions and millions of people to visit museums without actually physically going there and I, I imagine it has been very very active also during the pandemic I mean what what are your takeaways from this period uh hi Farah and hi everybody nice to see you guys um so, I mean, I think in general, obviously online, people are just spending a lot more time on the internet. And I think that's really expanded the possibility for online platforms to serve up culture. Um, you know, Rich is very familiar with YouTube as a platform for representing the culture uh, or you know, content that individuals can share. And I think that's been really expansive in terms of how we think about people being able to share where they're coming from uh, to people all over the world. And of course that's grown. Google Arts and Culture, you know, it's an incredible platform. It was founded about 10 years ago. And my sense in, in with both Google Arts and Culture and YouTube and other platforms at Google is that um, technology or COVID, the pandemic has only accelerated trends that were already in place. So museums that were already digitizing their collections coming online, people like Sarah who are already pushing the boundaries of how to bring technology to cultural experience um, found themselves ahead of the game. Uh, they were connecting with audiences in a very different way. Uh, other institutions that had less uh, resource or focus have had to catch up. Similarly for audiences, people are coming online and engaging with culture, obviously a lot more in terms of the time they're spending, but equally uh, technology companies, platforms like Google Arts and Culture and cultural institutions are gonna have to think about how to be more accessible. Uh, so we've worked really hard to think about how you represent culture online, not just in Western context, but equally around the world for audiences that are now engaging with culture off of their smartphone. You know, not necessarily everyone has uh, a computer, but also the themes that we look at, not everybody has had fine arts or museums. And so how do we represent culture of food, of fashion, of music, uh, and make sure that that's accessible. Finally, in terms of the fun parts of technology, um, you know, we've been doing a lot with machine learning, collaborating with artists, curators, musicians, songwriters, uh, and that's got a new life of its own. These were usually quite, we call them experiments at Google. We'd work with a choreographer to create a ballet using artificial intelligence uh, yeah. or an artist to create poetry using machine learning. Um, and suddenly there's just a lot more of it coming and audiences are engaging with it in different ways because um, you know, it's just more intuitive. Uh, of course, that doesn't take away from the fact that I think in the last year, local community has mattered a lot more than ever, and that's physical. You go to your local yeah. community center, you connect with your neighbors, and that has actually nothing to do with digital. Okay, great. Um, 
last but certainly not least is Javad Alipur, who um, uh, I have to say is of Iranian descent, as am I. And uh, I have to say that when we had our preparatory discussion, um, which I had with all of the, my panelists, Javad and I did speak Persian for the first bit, but I think that uh, we'll stick to English for now. <laughs> um, Javad is an award-winning um, theater writer and director. Um, he had a runaway hit called The, uh, the Brothers, uh, sorry, The Believers Are But Brothers. And uh, it was all about what radicalizes young Muslim men. And the particularity of this show was that basically the audience had to join a WhatsApp group um, when they sat in the theater and watched it, which is kind of extraordinary. In the WhatsApp, there was they had to basically uh, participate, and and they would receive messages on the WhatsApp, and they were, you know, really very much part of the production in a kind of uh, unusual, uh, very personal and very modern way. And so I I know Javad that your latest um, work is called Rich Kids: A History of Shopping Malls in Tehran, and that's been something that you've also um, kind of uh, turned into something also Instagram friendly. And there have been ways in which you've really uh, introduced technology into live theater. But so I, what has been your impression of these last 15 months and you know, what have you done or how do you approach this challenge? Well, you know, thank you. I mean, uh, I, yeah, I'm a writer. I can't actor. hear you very well. Can you, can you- um... Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Is that any better? Shall I move this computer? Yeah, can you move closer, yeah. yeah um, you know, uh, thank you for that introduction and, and it's great to meet everyone. Yeah, um, you know, uh, as you said, I'm a writer and director. There's a body of shows, there's a body of work that I've spent me making over the past couple of years, which is really about the intersection between contemporary technology and contemporary politics and how those two things uh, play with each other. As you said, the first show in that series was called The Believers Are But Brothers. I sometimes describe that as a show that set out to sort of uh, reiterate the question that goes, what's the, uh, uh, what radicalizes young Muslim men? And reiterate that as a question that goes, what radicalizes young men? Because that ends up, you know, in, in that show, we look at like the incel subculture in the oh, US right. and game again and all this sort of stuff as well. Um, and Rich Kids was the second part of that and looked at kind of the social churn in certain countries in the global south that, have, that, you, that you might call, post-imperialist or sort of post-colonial developmental dictatorships of various kinds and um, sort of uh, you know the way that the children of people like the guys who run the Iranian regime or Robert Mugabe or the way their sons behave on Instagram. In any case like I, I come from a tradition of theatre, it's, it's, it's interesting to talk about the sort of tech aspect of it, I think I come from a tradition of theatre where uh, you try. You say that you know form and fun form and content sit close to each other. So if something is about something, you're probably going to have some sort of fun if you put it in the show, you know. Um, and so both of these shows, when they started off as theatre pieces, had um, kind of like live stuff that happened on your phone. In one case, a WhatsApp group. In one case, an Instagram group. When we got into the um, pandemic, we'd already been commissioned to turn uh, the brother, uh, um, the Believers Are But Brothers into a standalone film for the BBC. So we had this asset and it was playing at a few sort of um, uh, cinema festivals, Copenhagen Docks, these places. And we thought, you know, all these festivals were moving online and we thought, hang on a second, we could bring the interactivity of the theatre version to sit alongside the thing that folk are watching at home on their TV screens and computers. So we built in lockdown conditions, literally the second week of lockdown, um, uh, we built this crazy international WhatsApp group to connect, you know, people watching films in like, you know, Copenhagen and New York and London and all these places. Oh, wow. Yeah, man. And then we we were due to transfer rich kids to Battersea Arts Centre. And it, like um, Sarah was saying, you know, there's this feeling of, you have responsibilities to your freelancers. You want to make some work for people. Yeah. And this was about eight months into the pandemic. Um, and we thought what people seem to be missing, there's a lot of archival work, but what people are missing is something that starts at half past seven, you know, and you can have a drink and sit down and watch it and you know other people are watching it with you. So we took this show that was originally live theatre plus an Instagram feed and made it, as you guys saw on the reel, made it something that sort of looks a little bit like a... 
a uh, little bit like a film, a little bit like a Zoom call, but also yeah. have this interactive, interactive Instagram thing. And fundamentally, that show is a show, Rich Kids, is a play about the nature of history. I'm not going to go into it now, do you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. You can, you can, you can uh, see my thoughts on that over 70 minutes uh, at a theatre okay. of your choice, uh, you know, over the next few months. Yeah. Um, because it's about the nature of history and time, it, we could have a lot of sort of uh, artistic fun with making people watch it at a certain time. And that... You know, I feel very lucky. Obviously, the big headline in terms of what, what's happened in the pandemic for artists is just brutality. Do you know what I mean? Very senior artists, people way above me in profile and stuff like this. Look at the draw in many respects. You know, people's careers are in uh, ruined, you know. Yeah. And we were lucky that we, we put this thing together. And again, like the Believers Are But Brothers, it caught fire, really. So it ended up uh, yeah. being in New York and at Sundance. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you, you make a really important point. I mean, there has been a lot of brutality. There's been a lot of blood, uh, bloodshed, you know, in the metaphorical sense uh, and uh, in, in, in the arts. And uh, we can't really um, lose sight of that. At this point, I do need to um, ask the audience two things. First of all, uh, if you have any questions, do shoot them in. You can send them in via the chat uh, function on your Zoom. The other thing that we would like you to do now is uh, to respond to this poll that's been prepared with some questions. Uh, it'd be great if you um, answered this audience poll, if you took the, took the multiple choice uh, poll, and then uh, we will you know, uh, basically be announcing the results shortly. I think I will be receiving them separately and I'll be sharing them with you. And then I think that there will be a poll also at the end that you'd be encouraged to take. But so those two, those two kind of uh, bits of homework for you, the audience, um, do send questions via chat because our session is only as good as you uh, you interacting with it, and uh, do take part in this poll. Thank you so much. And so I was I'm going to go back to to my speakers, if I may. But uh, I'd like first to ask Javad if he could um, raise the volume on his uh, um, laptop because your voice really is faint, and we need to hear from you properly. I think we can hear everyone else fine. Um, I'd like to bounce back to Sarah and, and Sarah, you know, there is this issue of access, which all of the speakers one by one have raised. I mean, um, you know, what Daniel does is very accessible. It's not, you know, you don't need to go to a fancy museum. You can go with your phone to the riverside in London and see, you know, all these augmented reality works on your phone. TikTok needs no explanation, complete access, open to everyone. Uh, and a way for these, um, you know, talented young people to overcome the obstacles to getting into the Royal Shakespeare Company, to getting into the National Theatre, to getting, you know, I mean, there are genuine obstacles. So the issue of accessibility and also Javad and Suhair obviously have spoken about this is a big one. Uh, Sarah, can you talk about the digital inequity that, that you were, um, you know, speaking to me about before? Sure, I mean, I think, it's also important to say that what the pandemic has done is exposed so many things that as an arts and culture sector, we are responding to whether, whoever you are in that and how, however that context sits. But one of the things that you, you see very quickly when you, when you have to create work in different ways is how do I get that work out there? For an artist, how do I get, how do I get people to see, see my work? And we did ask that question when we pivoted. We knew we were going to have to make a piece online. We knew we were going to, we were committed to using some of the most cutting edge immersive technologies. We knew all those things, but it came back to us really quickly that not everyone has technology in their homes that is accessible, yeah. that has the connectivity. Um, and not everyone has access to multiple um, devices and it's an intergenerational issue and I think if we were committed to to being accessible we needed to really address that so for, for us at the Royal Shakespeare Company in our pivot to an online performance we needed to ensure that we were giving our audiences the best experiences wherever they were in their homes so we had to create a piece and it's a complex thing we had to design artistically a piece using motion, motion capture technology, working with a game engine, creating digital characters and environments, but it had to be read on a mobile phone, which is very different to how you'd read it on a really high spec desktop. And it was really important that we did that and that audiences had the same quality of experience wherever they were, because 
what we were creating work for was their cultural spaces. Their homes became their cultural spaces. And as much as we were grieving our cultural space and in our buildings, equipping our audiences as they come to us, um, thinking about accessibility and inclusion in their visit to us, we were now going out there and we needed to really make our work in a way that didn't disenfranchise people at a time when they were feeling very unconnected and cut off. And that's been a really massively interesting aspect for us as we come out of the pandemic to think about what an inclusive recovery means and how we look at what we found at this time. And, and that connection with our audiences um, means that we have to think from the design, as soon as we work with the design of a piece of work, that we can't assume that everyone can connect with it. Yeah. And that's a really, really important um, provocation to us as we, we come through this to think about how we design our work for, for, for as many people as possible. Yeah, so for, for your bricks and mortar theatres and for the people at home on their mobile phones, I mean, yeah, build bridges between those two audiences. I mean, Rich, you're obviously in the business of mobile phones. I mean, that's your bread and butter. And so the, the, speak to us a little bit about access, access to theatre and the and the elitism oh. that the arts may be guilty of and yeah. how, you know, TikTok is battling that. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was so, so interesting listening to Sarah there and, and talk, and, you know, that the, the, this idea of, you know, people, people's home environment, you know, being the kind of stimulus for creative ideas. And of course, you know, I think for TikTok and for people using TikTok, that, that's incredibly true. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of, couple of things that, you know, really, stood out for me over the last year. One, one is just when, when the lockdown first happened, um, it, it, the fact that one of the things people clearly felt an urge to do was do something creative, uh, you know, partly because they wanted, you know, they wanted to laugh, but they wanted some kind of shared connection and they wanted to express themselves. And, and, and that happened on, on many platforms, but I mean, it happened on TikTok in an enormous way in the first uh, few months uh, of the pandemic. And, and I think there was a there was a sense of personal expression, and there was a sense of of a broader, you know, collective connection around that, which was just so interesting. And then the other the other thing that really interested me, and and really links, I think, to what Sarah was saying, is perhaps from from the from a, from a different end of of uh, the scale. But the the thing um, one thing that happened on TikTok was was people organized, self organized. Uh, to create artistic works um, in ways that we've we've just never seen before, and 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 some people may or may not have heard of of uh, Ratatouille the musical, um, but uh, that was an example where a a TikTok user posted uh, a video just making a, a a kind of a reference to Ratatouille the the Disney movie um, of something that was just a bit of a joke and a bit of fun. And then there's a there's a there's a feature on TikTok where you can duet someone else's video, which means you can record and, and post a video alongside the first video. And somebody took that original post, which was just you know a kind of throwaway thing, and built on it and said, "Oh, wouldn't it be fun if I sort of started to write some lyrics to a song about Ratatouille, about a rat?" And someone else posted another video on top of that and said, "Oh, well, this is how it might look if we were to stay, you know, stay. Well, this is what the, the costumes might look like." And you ended up with this chain of, of responses and, and additions um, uh, and, and people adding different vocal harmonies as they did start to create songs. It became this incredibly rich collaborative work um, which existed on TikTok. And then most amazingly, it actually then became a, an hour long uh, live uh, musical event uh, which happened at the beginning of January to raise money for acting charity. So, that whole example, I think, for me, just demonstrates the power of a, a you know, a, a, you know, a kind of a technology and an environment and a community that enables people to riff off Absolutely. of each other and come mm -hmm. together. So, so you know, back to your point and your question, I think, you know, access access comes in lots of different ways, but uh, alongside access, you need you need stimulus and you need inspiration and you need the kind of community, you know, where people can, uh, can create together. And, and so I think, you know, those are things that, 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 you know, many of our cultural centers, whether it's theaters or other places have, have, have provided over, you know, many, many years. And I think, um, you know, we're learning, uh, you know, as, as technology 
uh, you know, develops. I think, you know, that, that we're learning that those things, you know, can exist and, and can be enhanced in new ways, which I think is quite exciting. Right, yeah. I would like to um, um, turn to Daniel now and say, Daniel, I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Because you're also creating, with some of these augmented reality works, obviously you're creating work for the mobile phone. And, and what are your thoughts as someone who used to run museums and as a thinker and a writer about these issues? What are your thoughts about the elitism of the uh, traditional art world versus the accessibility of something that, an art that can be enjoyed on a, on a phone? Well, since I spent most of my professional life in you know, more traditional museums and biennials and so on, I, I, I wouldn't now say that I have anything against them. But of course, we all know that it takes uh, you know, some kind of courage and not everyone uh, finds it you know, normal to just walk into the National Gallery or the Tate or, or the Stadelic or the whatever. Um, you know, some of the works that we have done could only be shown in classical uh, art institutions. I mean, at um, the, the week uh, 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 when the pandemic kind of, when it all became, became known to us, we opened this very complex AR, VR show at the Serpentine Gallery uh, with Chao Fei from China. Yeah, it was extraordinary, yeah. Wonderful. Probably the most complex things we had uh, produced. And that was kind of a tragedy that, uh, as Sara said, it's the worst, it's the last thing you want to do, force, you know, people to look, uh, to put on a headset and, uh, you know, with the, you know, huge audiences that actually flew in from China to see this famous Chinese artist. But anyhow, so we moved on to AR and that is maybe, you know, out of necessity so that we could continue working. And um, and yes, that can really reach out beyond any kind of traditional structure. It is interesting that, you know, you don't need the art fair and you don't need a museum and you don't need anything. However, there are other challenges, of course. I mean, the, the show we did here in London um, was visible, but it was also totally invisible. It's part of the, you know, it, it's, it's the nature of this uh, medium that unless you talk about it, no one knows about it. So you don't necessarily need a major museum, but you need some sort of media partner or something, which, which, which we had. But yes, it's interesting that anyone with a relatively contemporary telephone, of course, that limits things a bit too. But if you have a, you know, you don't need the latest, latest iPhone, but you need a, a relatively advanced uh, device. So to, to really see these, um, these AR shows. But, you know, I think it is a curatorial possibility. It's probably also a possibility for, you know, for other uh, art disciplines. And that's why it's so interesting for me to listen to all of you. I don't rip any from the museum world, but it is a curatorial possibility and and it also you know the pandemic fast forwarded all of this and uh, i think it was again sarah who said that you know this is um, or um uh, no it was suhar so said suhar who said that you know it fast forwarded processes that we were already aware of and um, you know some people have emphasized that the uh, all of this the whole art you know last year and a half should be seen as some sort of um, what's, what's the word a, a dress rehearsal no you know kind of you know a test for a bigger transformation and um, you know the art world is always something a bit a bit perverse it's always you know fantastic when it comes to mirroring um, inequalities and politics but it's also often you know the worst and the best of mankind at once <laughs> especially the commercial kind of art world um, you know where you fly to another continent for a weekend to look at art and then you you know you ship it back in a in a crate and uh, you know with the same airplane maybe and also the non-commercial art world that i belong to is not necessarily much better i mean i would i've been I was probably one of the worst. I used to work for the Venice Biennale and it would just go across the globe and, and go to some conference and talk about global warming and then fly home. Sorry, but you know, a little bit, it's been like this. And we know that this needs to change. And, and um, it wasn't only, I think it was Noam Chomsky who said it first, at least the first person who I heard saying it, and then Bruno Latour and other intellectuals, but actually Mac Macron and Angela Merkel have both used this kind of, dress rehearsal metaphor that, you know, this is a way to get ready for other, you know, another way to inhabit our planet, another way to kind of new behavioral patterns. And maybe the art world could be a leader here and, and you know, show us at least, you know, a glimpse of new possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Javad, I, I will 
go, go to Suhair after Javad, but I mean, there's something that Javad said to me when we were speaking earlier on, uh, which is sort of in a similar vein to what uh, Daniel was just saying, but in the theater sphere. Javad, if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting, and this time hopefully we'll hear you better. Um, you were saying to me, you know, that from the theater perspective, you know, you can't go on banging out the same Chekhovs for the for 30 years. Yeah. And so you, you know, you you were saying that some of the the some of the offerings from uh, performance halls and theaters and uh, yeah. etc. was a little bit um, obsolete or maybe a little old fashioned, and you had to kind of move with the game and use the interactive tools to cultivate new audiences that put the put the technology at the service of the art, right? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, for sure, man. I mean, like, um, I suppose uh, to circle back onto that conversation of like equity and stuff like that, like, yeah. you know, there's, I'm, I am, I think the thing about that conversation is you always have to be specific. People who don't get to come play, don't get to come play for very specific and different reasons to each other. And it's very easy to go, there's a sort of unwashed poor mass of people who all need to be helped in some way. Actually, yeah. people are individuals with different stories and stuff. And for me, growing up with my heritage where I did, there's a, still a big question in European theatre, uh, gen specifically European art more broadly, about uh, the kind of racial or ethnic exclusion of, you know, large parts of uh, immigrants into, into Western Euro Europe, you know, the, the sort of people who would be Pakistani or Kurdish in England or Algerian in France or, you know, Turkish in Germany. As it happens, I'm just now calling in from uh, the end of rehearsals for a, a new show in, in Germany. And, a similar thing sort of in here is in the discussion here and and i'm i'm very i consider myself a political artist and i kind of go what does that mean what's the point of that but i think the point of political art is hopefully not to be didactic it's hopefully not to be preaching but it's about looking around the world and seeing that the the, the nature of political discourse and discussion is so broken that we can't even we can't even um, you know uh, as the cliche goes um uh, agree on what the facts of the situation are. So perhaps there's something about a creative civic space of storytelling that can uh, bring people together, make them feel complicit in something altogether that, that other spaces can't. Now for that to work, you need this kind of equity. And, and really, you know, a lot of theatres in England, a lot of artistic institutions, my experience is, I've worked at a bunch of them, you know, um, my experience is people will be going like, oh, well, why haven't X community around the corner come in to see our show? And the, the answer is always some magical thing to do with like, they're scared of the venue or something like this. And I'm just like, I don't know, like I, I think about this a lot with the communities I grew up with, working class Muslim communities. And I go in those communities, man, I'm like, everyone quotes the wire at you, everyone's into music. Every, they just find, you know, forgive me, but like, they find your shit boring, man. Do you know what I mean? They, they're not interested in what you've got to say. And you can't, there's a very, it's a very selfish way to make work because you yourself happen to be interested in it. So to take the example of rich kids of history of shopping malls in Tehran, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that our audiences tend to be, and we've got to play all over the world. And we found that when we're supported properly, when the marketing works properly, we get younger audiences, we get more ethnically diverse audiences than definitely than standard theatre ones. And then you see that you get, often you get this wonderful moment. And it's, there's a bit in Rich Kids, it does, it, as I say, it uses Instagram as a metaphor for history. So there's a bit where we talk about an Instagram scene, which is called Mall Wave, that I'm not gonna go into, people might have heard of, might not. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. And I start talking about it, and you see this wonderful distinction between sort of like people above, let's say, I don't know where the, the boomer generation starts, but like sort of 40, 55 and above and below, where like the 55 and above bit of the audience are like, what the hell is this madness? And like the, the kids younger than that are like, oh, he's doing the more wave bit, wicked. Yeah, we've been waiting to see this in, in like yeah, a- Yeah, yeah, I know. There is a bit of an age divide as well, isn't there? Yeah. So um, for, for me, yeah. I think it's like, it's about, you know, um, if we're serious about wanting to be an important, play a, a, an important, the important role that art can in society, we have to be serious about where we put our money and what risks we take and what work we make. Yeah, great. I mean, I am going to turn to Suhair now uh, before giving you the results of the poll, but at first I'd like to hear from Suhair on this theme that we were just touching on. Um, I think that Google scrapped its uh, VR app Expeditions and you migrated that to Google Arts and Culture because you uh, realized that it wasn't accessible to all learners. Not everyone has VR goggles. Of course, Daniel has many pairs of VR, VR goggles, but that's, you know, his gig. But I mean, I certainly don't have a pair of VR goggles at home. 
Um, I don't know if any of the other panelists do. Um, yeah, so here, could you talk about this whole notion of accessibility and how Google acted on it by scrapping this VR um, app? Okay, I mean, I really want to know the results of the poll, but I will. Yeah, I will speak. So I think, um, you know, technology is iterative. So I think it makes sense. You know, when you work for a tech company, you're constantly building things, and we, you know, we kind of get rid of things and move on from them. When not doing really very well. Like, oh, can you not hear me? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, I was saying that I, for me, technology is iterative, and so we have a process, usually at tech companies, where we build technologies, in some cases we spend a lot of time, maybe too much time rolling them out, and then we push them aside. So I think in that sense, you know, rolling off of Google Expeditions, which was an incredible project, very accessible in the sense that a Google Cardboard, which was used for the VR experience, cost like five to ten dollars. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it makes sense if it wasn't working and if it wasn't getting to enough people during lockdown, you know, if they were not being able to access the devices and the technology, then you move on and you, you fold one product into another. I think what is important from this conversation is to think about exactly this is who has access to technology? Do they understand how it should be used? Is it like TikTok where they make it their own? Um, and how, where is that line? Where is the bridge between, for example, I think there was a question earlier in this chat about um, who takes technology into culture for the future? So there's a question of resources, money, who pays for stuff, but also where do you find that engagement? So you can have the completely uncurated, um, maybe unregulated uh, content that you see on TikTok, which is accessible, which people from around the world, even those who are illiterate, are being able to use and find joy from. Um, and then there is this the traditional cultural institution. Uh, and where do you find the space where Google, for example, provides the platform, uh, the National Gallery works with us to digitize their Artemisia Gentileschi show and we put it online. Yeah. Uh, but for a relatively niche audience versus thinking more creatively about what is culture, uh, where do people want to connect with it and how does technology engage? I mean, a few of the projects we've done or a lot of our work is becoming more open source. Uh, we have an incredible archaeologist who works with Google Arts and Culture, and he's done a lot of work in bringing online cultural sites from around the world uh, that are at risk from everything from climate change to tourism to war and conflict. Um, we've done one series of projects with an organization called SciArc, where we brought online, I think now almost 40 important heritage sites from uh, Palmyra to Rapa Nui online using laser scanning and creating immersive reality experiences which you can access through your mobile device uh, or your laptop um, and the data is downloadable so anyone could download um, the 3d models of point clouds that were created by the laser scanning and then build their own augmented reality experience out of it another example is we've just launched same guy um, last week a project on language um, and languages at risk. So there's 7,000 languages in the world, about I think 3,000 are at risk um, from, from sort of disappearing. And so it's an app where there's like 10 languages where you can take a picture um, of an object and using visual you know, machine learning, it'll identify you know, what is this object and give you the word in one of these languages. I think it's like Yiddish and um, uh, Aboriginal languages and so on. And so this is an amazing experiment because it allows people to connect with the language in a playful way that they wouldn't be able to and that possibly might be lost. Uh, but again, this is open source. So anybody can start adding to this like, you know, cloud of languages that we have and expanding it over time. Uh, and I, so I, kind of uh, alternative to Google Translate, I guess, which people have been using. <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it's, it can be used in that way or not. Well, it could possibly use, but it's, you know, you take a picture of something, yes, of course, but these are languages that would not be on Google Translate because there's a lot of people out there in the world that would look for uh, the Yiddish translation of, of a particular word necessarily. And so it's, a, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what cultural institutions do. They preserve yeah. culture when money may not be available or they may not be demand for something. And that's, I think, where we need to think about where is the value of putting resources, time and support in, in terms of technology behind culture? Is it to support institutions that wouldn't be able to survive otherwise and that are important and necessary for us to see ourselves, our own identity and to connect with one another? Or is it as much to think about what's fun, what's scalable, what people might connect with because it's interesting to them in a the moment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna have to find the bridge and the space between these two things because at yeah. the end of the day, Okay. Questions like what Javad has asked, um, you know, 
these uh, only an artist would ask those questions. He's the only artist on this call. And it's really important for us to continue to sustain that and not just to worry about the numbers. And that's why, you know, I think that money will have to be put aside like governments do. And I think increasingly there needs okay. to be okay. more responsibility okay. from organizations that can afford to do that. Yeah. Okay, we, we need to go to the poll now because we've got about, uh, I guess, 35 minutes left uh, with this conversation. So this is the result of the poll. How has your cultural behavior changed over the past year? What regular activity do you do now, which you may not have done before? Multiple choice, 71% online performances, theater, music, dance. So that's very good news for um, a number of our panelists, Javad and Sarah, I guess, uh, most directly, but also Rich. Um, otherwise, let's see, what's the next highest percentage? Online talks and discussions. That's good news for all of us here today doing this panel. Uh, and um, I think those are the two big winners of this particular pan, uh, poll. Uh, then uh, we also have online exhibitions or OVR rooms, that's 34%. Because of course, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't imagine that there would be an overwhelming number of audience members who like to watch art uh, in these OVR rooms. Uh, we can maybe discuss that with Daniel later. Um, and then there's of course reading 30%, which is a bit low. Augmented reality 5% and virtual reality 5%. I mean, that I find that really quite surprising. I would have thought that AR and VR would have a higher showing. Um, let me bounce over. Um, I'm going to close the screen. By the way, we are going to take the poll again at the end. So um, do vote again. And, and let's see if you, your view, view changed at all. Uh, I think the question is the same. It may be a different one. Anyway, there is another poll coming your way. And we also invite your questions uh, via chat. But so Javad, what is your reaction to the fact, to what we just saw? Um, which kind of is good news for you, which is to say, uh, you know, that, that people uh, really did watch a lot of performances online. It was like a 70% uh, of, of our audience watching performances online, and you do need to unmute. Well, yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting. Like, it's, it's, you know, it's obviously, it's obviously great that people are watching things. Um, uh, you know, um, we, we've, we've sort of touring rich kids, I'm touring rich kids very much yeah. from like, you know, our bedrooms um like that um we sort of saw that basically we saw that i think there was something especially about after the first half of the pandemic like if if you were able to work make work that felt eventy like people would people would really engage people would do more zoom calls like after having done a day of zoom if it felt like there was a reason to do it you know that felt what do you mean eventy um, I meant like I mean like work that feels like um, feels like an event that feels, feels like, like you're going to the theater at half past ten. Right, it, it sort of cuts through the normal way that time time works a little bit, um, as in the old days, all sorts of things used to do. Um, so yeah, that's 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 great to see. I mean, I think it's interesting with that question of like, it's like what are you what do you do that you've not done before? I mean, I've engaged with bits of VR and AR like through the pandemic, but to be honest, I was engaging with that a bit before, whereas weirdly enough, I wasn't watching archive of, you know, the Shaobin or the National before. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, 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 let's say busman's holiday bit of the, the pandemic for people who work in theater. Um, and so yeah, man, I think you see, I think there's a really interesting question for me that goes like, again, if we're gonna talk about this like, the, the, the actual transformative nature that art can play like certainly in the UK I'm not sure how this works in the rest of Europe in the UK there's not really any data on, on who those people are there's a little bit held by institutions there's very little held by any kind of central body like the Arts Council I know that they're supposed to be doing some work but that's you know I'm not sure what they've actually got to work with and so on and I remember I, I hope that we find a way to move the conversation on because I remember I've been working in theatre for like well, theatre and film for like 10 years now. And so I remember the moment when uh, all the big institutions decided to go on Twitter because that's how they were gonna like reach out to people that they hadn't reached out before. Yeah. And of course, you look at the follow Twitter followers of any theatre in the UK and like half of them are other theatres. So I think there's gonna be, gonna be a, a really interesting bit of thinking to do after we get the data through and just see, because I mean, the whole point for me, you know, and there's people on this call who are obviously much more actual sort of tech people than me. But it seems to me that the thing that I found most bewitching about the internet is that it's possible to make a community for almost anything internationally. Like however niche your business or your 
you know, your, your thing is, there will be 3,000 people somewhere on the face of the earth who want to do it with you, you know? And I just, I, I think for me, the, the next sort of question for us as artists who aren't sort of digital artists or whatever, is to start to be a bit more permeable, and for our institutions, to start to think about being a bit more permeable across those two spaces. Yeah, I mean, I would like to actually ask Sarah about this, but before I do, let me jump over to Daniel and ask Daniel what he thought of this poll result, which is to say that, you know, AR and VR are still a little bit niche uh, and 5% of our audience were actually engaging with it. I get, it, is it because the equipment is, is, is lacking? Is it because it, it seems complicated? I mean, what, what's going on? I mean, I'm not surprised that VR is not that present. It's still, you know, it's still a relatively new thing. And um, I mean, in a way, when something new like this appears, a, a new visual medium, basically, it's also an interesting period when we don't really know what it is. There's this window of experimentation before it becomes uh, normal and, you know, totally commercialized and, uh, you know, just, um, you know, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not so unhappy with this situation still that it's, you know, a new thing that people, artists are trying to figure out. And many of the artworks that we've done in VR are not about reaching big audiences or anything. It's more about perceptual possibilities. You know, when Anish Kapoor does a VR piece, it's not to find a new distribution model. It's to kind of explore a new medium in a way that, you know, makes and develop artistic um, possibilities that he couldn't have done if he, he sculpted it or filmed it or painted it. And so that I think when it comes to AR, I actually think that the poll reflects uh, the age of the people uh, who are participating in our, uh, you know, in this conversation. Uh -huh. because there are, uh, you know, um, things that you may have heard of, even if it's not really our something like Pokemon Go or something. I actually do think that AR is a pretty big thing already but not necessarily, uh, you know, when it comes to our, what we share here, you know, people, uh, no, I, I, it would be interesting to hear what, what, what Rick says, but, you know, I think it's actually growing and it's going to be a very, very big thing. It's not only Ikea who has, that has, you know, introduced an AR function, actually, you know, it's, it's all over the place, it's the biggest companies and there are these games and everything. I totally agree, Daniel. Yeah. I totally agree. It's, you know, AR effects are one of the biggest, you know, categories of effects that people like to use on TikTok. And, you know, it's, um, it, it's definitely something that is, you know, it is a big thing already, as you say, you know, maybe not in, in every sort of, you know, area of sort of artistic mm -hmm. uh, or culture, but, but certainly I think online and, and with a number of platforms and it, it's, you know, it's becoming really, really big. And I think, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing people really adopt it, um, you know, for a range of purposes, often, you know, for humor and connection, but we're definitely starting to see, as you say, Ikea doing all sorts of, you know, clever things in terms of what you could do with AR, you know, from a, from a, from a functional point of view. So there's that side to it too. Yeah, great. We've got uh, some audience questions, uh, which is very exciting. So um, may I uh, call on uh, Deepika Srivastava? Uh, could we have uh, the question from Deepika, please? Deepika, if you could unmute and ask your question. We're seeing you on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, such amazing insights on how the culture and tech sector has been innovating. Uh, my question is, uh, like, I want to ask about how, you know, did you address the issue of screen fatigue? Because, you know, with the constant digital access, we are all getting headaches, we're all having this issue. And uh, when making cultural content accessible, how did you address this? And also, if you did any experiments with purely audio content? So, Purely audio content. Yeah, that's yeah. a good question. I mean, um, I don't know. I, I might uh, hand over to to Rich again, uh, uh, or or maybe Sarah. Maybe Sarah, you could you could address this issue of, of screen fatigue. I mean, mind you, you're you're in the theater. I don't know which of you would like to jump on that question. Maybe uh, Suhair. I can jump on. I can jump Probably on. Rich, you know, I'll definitely pick up Javad's uh, comment from earlier about yeah. making digital and screen-based experiences feel different and feel special, I think is, is very important. And actually, I think we're, we're in the very early stages of people realizing how to do that. 
Um, but but I think you know the, the 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 premise of the question is a really good one. You know, I think people have you know got serious screen fatigue and, and Zoom fatigue, and and so hey, thank you everyone for joining this. But you know, we, we've all and it's been a you know very unnatural situation, but. I do think as we come out of it into a more balanced, uh, you know, way of living and working where we're not on screens all the time, I, I'm actually really optimistic that we're going to take some of the innovations and things that we've learned during, you know, this time that we've had to be on screens and, 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 and we'll make the time we're on screens, you know, better and more creative. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, good point. I was going to say we're not going to spend the rest of our lives on Zoom. And uh, hopefully in the near future, when something like this takes place, we will all be sitting on a stage mm -hmm. next to each other. <laughs> yeah, I also, I just to add, I think that what some of the work that we've done, and I'm sure all of these tech platforms are doing is thinking about accessibility. So, um, you know, can you experience in the same way if you see or hear or understand differently? And I think this has been a really amazing sort of speeding up process is thinking about digital accessibility. And um, so people are to use a platform uh, to make sure that they're able to enjoy it as much as possible uh, because they can't experience the world in, in, in the same way anymore. Uh, the second thing I think is really important is that, especially with culture that you can experience in real life, it's really necessary to Farah's point to, to be able to experience it. So uh, technology should be supplemental. It should be an additional layer to how you experience the world and culture. And I think that probably all of us agree that um, there's no replacement for going to a museum or visiting uh, Petra in Jordan and, and having um, connecting with people around you. And you know, having just taught a couple of university classes this year, I felt so strongly uh, this lack of connection to, to others uh, in trying to have ideas and, and, and be creative. So I think it's really important to continue to drive that home and for us to remember that culture is about connecting, well-being, growing, expanding, and not just about having an experience and shutting, shutting it off and, and walking away from it. And those questions have not yet been answered. Thank you very much, Deepika, uh, for your question. Really appreciate your uh, being with us. It really means a lot to see uh, someone from our audience uh, on a screen next to us. We, we, we feel less lonely. Thank you. Um, and I'd li like to turn to Sarah now, who also has a question for us. Welcome, Sarah. Hi. Um, Thank you so much for such an interesting uh, discussion. I wondered if um, the panel could talk a little bit about what you think the legacy of art created on TikTok or other social media platforms is going to be in the future when, you know, as we've said, the technology will move forward, these platforms will become defunct. And how then do we contextualize them within, you know, the kind of art historical terms? Do you consider them to have equal uh, value or weight or whatever word you want to choose uh, for that to historical traditional media. I would like to turn to Sarah. Is that okay, Sarah? Would you would you like to take Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think first thing to say is that theatre is ephemeral and has been ephemeral for, for, for centuries. And that also theatre's always had a relationship with technology as well. We we have innovated for centuries and we will innovate ourselves out of this um, this moment. And I think that what's been incredibly exciting is that um, we have found space, we have found shared connections, we have found shared spaces for us to find that. We have found the connection points of which there are many and I hope that that diversifies, brings greater relevance and also unlocks different ways that we can connect. And, and when you, so it's a really important thing to say when you're talking about um, what, what you're talking about is the timeline here, aren't you? The, the reflect, the, what, how will we look back at this moment? How will we mark that? How will we archive that? What will be the collective narrative around this time? And artists are so crucial to that. And I think that, yes, we're talking about platforms, but we're talking about the, this, the discourse around it. If we look at Shakespeare's plays, if we look at, um, if we look at the like the folio, which will be, the anniversary will be in 2023 of Shakespeare's first folio, it, the, it was that innovation of the printing press allowed us to keep those plays alive. But there's also about the social commentary around the work, around the artistic discussion. And we're capturing that in a really fragmented way, whether that's tweets or whether that's TikTok or whether that's um, like, reviews or for example and it's really I think the more fundamental question around this is 
we are giving space to our artists, we are giving space for the work to be created, are we giving space for the conversations to be had? And I think Javad brought it up earlier and so did Daniel, who is in this forum, who is in this debate, who are we putting on our platforms for this conversation? And, and how are we capturing that? And are we bringing that together or are we creating those bubbles of, of, of critical debate? And I think the opportunity here is not to look so much at platform, but to look at the interconnectivity of how we use those platforms intergenerationally, geographically, locally, and make sure that, um, that that's held and we've remembered that and that has been captured. So um, Sarah is also asking an underlying question, which I'd like to throw to Daniel. I mean, Sarah is saying, but is it art? And that kind of is what she's yeah. asking. But Daniel, is this uh, the, the ARs, the creations that you that you make, is it art? Is it, are the TikTok videos, which I absolutely adore, which you'll see in the film reel, you know, they're 60 second performances, mini performances. Is this all kind of art? Will it will it survive the test of time? I mean, again, when, um, you know, this is a little bit of me art medium history, perhaps, but, you know, when photography appeared, uh, yeah. there were lots of misunderstandings and exaggerations. This uh, is 150 years ago. Uh, is it um, science? Is it uh, occult science? Will it kill painting? What is it? You know, it became a very, very visible medium, uh, um, uh, but it took quite a while until traditional art institutions actually took it seriously as art. Even if the surrealists, for instance, that's around 1920, were you know really using photography a lot, but it, it took a while until the institutions caught up. And institutions do have power, actually. You know, when it comes to that question that Farah now asks, is is, is it art? I'm 100% sure that some of this is not art, <laughs> but I'm also very <laughs> certain that some things may be art, and and that they and, and that we will know. It takes a while. I mean, one thing which is maybe a theme for another conversation, um, and so I hope we can all continue this, is uh, the fact that, you know, digital art is, um, you know, or even video art has, has been very, video art has been very present in the institutions. Every biennial was almost dominated by videos and projections uh, since the 90s, but it hasn't been so strong in, let's say, the museums and the, the collecting institutions and the art market. And, um, and, and digital art, even less so. It's almost, we have this idea that everything that is digital will be for free or it will just reach people everywhere. And that's a pretty kind of strong, um, uh, yeah, that's a strong tendency. In very recent months, this is not our conversation here, but actually there's this development of so-called NFTs, you know, that are unique objects in the, in the dig digital realm, and that secures, uh, you know, that makes possible uh, precious objects that actually can be collected and a little bit what we have been doing we haven't really been into the whole blockchain world that is you know a different conversation perhaps but the people have always said that you know this will be of relevance for our digital experimentation and we always thought that you know reintroducing scarcity and things that are you know limited editions and all of that in a digital sphere will make clear that these are also things that can be collected it's a bit a bit paradoxical that you know it has to be rare to be art or something i'm not sure that i, I, I you know I, I think that's true but the art world as we knew it with museums that collect collectors that want to have you know precious objects somehow that old art world needs um rare you know, scarcity and, uh, it, it's a bit of a different conversation because you know television is you know i think uh, when when uh, samuel beckett started to work for television or ingmar Bergman, i think that was art so i mean i i'm pretty 100 percent sure about that but uh, you know there are yeah i, si I simply can't answer your question as okay, you, you as know you i mean it's a yeah. big i'm sorry i didn't mean to can, I, can I throw in something on that yeah All right. we, we, yeah Go yeah. ahead, Javad. Yeah, we do I think, have I think it's more questions, but yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that, the institutional point that Daniel's making. I also think it's interesting as well to think about that, like you say, when Ingmar Bergman comes in or when Samuel Beckett comes in, because we were, uh, uh, Farah and I were talking about this, about this a bit on our call, and I was saying, like, with some uh, kinds of, like, digital art or tech driven art, I think I would say it like this, like, you know, if you look at like a very, very, very oversimplified version of the history of cinema, you basically get it from two places. You get it from you know, kind of Europe and Germany and you get it from America. And in Germany, for whatever reason, it's artist led early on. Whereas in America, where, where does where does where does the film start? They start as a special extra thing that tours with a carnival, you know, roll up, roll up, 
see a lion move on a screen, that kind of thing. Um, like, you know, consider the technical things that we can make happen. And I think there's a lot of that space where, you know, a lot of, especially, I mean, some of that work is great, but especially a lot of VR work where I think we are still at the place where roll up, roll up and see the lion move on the screen. And let us say Ingmar Bergman and Samuel Beckett haven't arrived yet. Um, but, you know, I, I look forward to it. Great. I mean, we've got a few more questions uh, and um, questioners in the queue. We have uh, Sarah. Could we um, go to Sarah? I is she with us? Um, okay. I don't see Sarah coming up. Uh, I think we, we are going now to Jonathan. Jonathan Norbury, please do put your question to us. Hello, Jonathan. Welcome. Please unmute and... Um, and, and we're all ears. You're not unmuted. Sorry, having a problem there. Yeah, my question really is on behalf of more traditional arts institutions mm -hmm. um, and how we balance access to a wider audience, potentially a global audience, uh, with a need to cover core costs, which is a kind of very real thing at the moment. Yeah, I think, um, Sarah, would you, um, would you want to take that on? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the cost issue, which I think Suhera also mentioned as well, is that we need to certainly be advocating for. We we know there's a demand, but we need the knowledge and we need the infrastructure and 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 we need that whether we we say we're traditional or whether we say we we're part of a, a community that's on the tech side or 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 anything. However, we identify in this space, I think it's really important. To look at the true costs of what we need to deliver this work and and it's um they, there are hard um costs to that but there's also um ways that we can share knowledge so what i have been really you know with the audience of the future project that we did we were a partnership of 14 organizations research partners technology companies and arts organizations of varying scales and of varying audiences looking at the future of live performance and it was that ecology that allows it allowed us to diversify but it also made more it more interesting for the work it made it more interesting for the people we employed and it also we are committed to sharing the learnings because right now we can't look at ourselves individualistically. We are building an ecosystem and we're building an infrastructure collectively with arts and culture. And we have to do that together and we should do that together. So I think the pivot of the question is, how can we share our learnings? How can we make sure, you know, the access points, I know there was one question on the chat here around, you know, using cutting edge technologies, universities are great to partner with for that. And we'll work with people, whether they're an institution or an independent artist. And there's something around knowing what our superpowers are, knowing where our weaknesses lie and being really open about that. So we, we build it collectively. Um, and I think that collaboration and interdisciplinary work are really vital to that. And, and also where we do have privilege and where we can, can have a voice, I think it's really crucial that we are advocating and lobbying for this work where we can get future investment, whether that's from a technology company working in partnership or whether that's at government level, it's really, really crucial. And we represent our sector, we don't represent ourselves. If, if that makes any sense, that's really important to say as well. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your question. We really appreciate I, it. Sorry, I also wanted to add to that because I sure. I feel very strongly that there is, um, and, and, you know, I'm sure Sarah can add to this, but there's been, a, in all professions, there's been this idea that you should be replicating your previous life for content online and so live streaming an entire, um, uh, you know, show or, or theater production, um, or, you know, bringing an entire museum collection online. And I think that for us, uh, a lot of the content that's always worked best is a little bit more bold and scrappy and playful. And I think in my own experience, working with a lot of very important cultural institutions, that's the hardest bridge is when you're working with a curator whose entire you know career has been spent preserving and telling the story of medieval manuscripts or a particular kind of masterpiece or a museum director whose responsibility it is to safeguard uh, the collection of their institution. It's very hard to think about presenting this in a way that feels a little bit more non-serious where you're doing a YouTube collaboration with two YouTube influencers in LA with a British library curator um, or going behind the scenes and showing the nuts and bolts at uh, you know the storage facilities for English heritage or the you know 
basement at Buckingham Palace. And A, that's content that's always much more fun and much more accessible. And secondly, it also unpacks, you know, the five years of work that goes into an exhibition that, you know, is ephemeral to, to Sarah's point, uh, but isn't ever really shared properly, in, you know, outside of a museum catalog. So I would say, I mean, I've looked at the, you know, incredible people who've joined this call in, in the chat. And I think for anyone who's thinking about you, know, you don't have to invest so much resource or time or money in thinking about how you can just be a bit more open with sharing what goes on, you know, in the fish room at the Natural History Museum or, um, you know, with your curators and, and behind the scenes and, and just play with it and, and see how people connect with it because it's a way of unpacking your knowledge because that's what each of you is. You represent an institution that's a knowledge generator yeah. as much as one that is showcasing culture right. and to keep that in mind when you think about technology. Okay, we, we have about... Twin, uh, sorry, 11 minutes left to this panel. So I think we need to jump to a couple more questions. We have one from Jan Kaliris. Jan, welcome, lovely to see you. Hi. Hey, what thanks. is your question? <laughs> oh, thanks for such an interesting conversation. And sorry, I had to move rooms because it got noisy upstairs. Um, I wanted to just address the need for um, having people pay for content. The bigger companies are you know, very well funded, they can offer content for free. People like Wigmore Hall in our position, for instance, we're a musical uh, education charity. Um, how do we get people to pay for content? Is that more funding or are we, or is there a case for just re-educating audiences to accepting paying for content like they do for sport? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'll throw that to Javad because uh, Javad was saying to me when we prepared this uh, panel that people are prepared to pay large amounts of money for football matches and meals, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So how can we convince them to pay for some of your content, for instance, Javad? Um, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, yeah, no, it, it, it goes back to that point that I was making about, I think there's sometimes a little bit of, uh, you know, fancy footwork that goes around on the idea of like diversifying and appealing to everyone. And then you get the idea that, oh, well, everyone who doesn't come to our institution can't afford it or something like this. And actually, you know, like, um, uh, there are huge, you know, there are massive parts of this country that will spend all kinds of money on, uh, uh, you know, evenings out eating, like you were saying, you know, gigs, things like this. You don't, don't necessarily come and, and play with us, so to speak. Um, I think for me, part of the, you know, the headline with that is it goes back the work to the work you make and why you make it, like what the point of you as an institution is. And 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 I'm not. This isn't you know. Uh, I if you know. Um, uh, I think was it was it uh, Jam was it? Um, yeah, you know, and 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 Jam. This isn't. Um, this is certainly not directed directed at you. I think it's interesting that sometimes we end up with uh, sector because people feel that pressure of like how um, you know how do you say it? how uh, uh, important to them their institution is. They feel like the reproduction of the institution becomes the most important thing rather than there necessarily being a big artistic and political and social reason for the for the for the the, the stuff we're doing. And I think if that's served. Then you get into that question is there an easy way to magic up people paying for things online i mean i don't think there is um what i would say is that there is um uh what i would say is that the internet is full of examples of how actually quite small communities can really care about something to the point where they do support it like you know the interesting example to give is the podcast world where like if you're doing a if you're doing a thousand people every two weeks like you're a big deal podcast, basically. Of course, that's a thousand people who are giving you their ears to whisper into yeah. for like an hour, man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and at that stage, then people do start, you know, uh, making money off and stuff. I mean, obviously, what seen as we are having in this conversation in the UK, the 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 question that goes unspoken is the question of government subsidy and the the, the stuff around that. I feel like yeah. it's another chat. On that's another point. chat. Yeah, yeah, and I would like to thank you very much, Jan, for your question. I, it was lovely to see you, and uh, we don't mind that you had to change rooms. <laughs> we could see you walking down the stairs. <laughs> uh, all right. I, uh, I Rich, yes, I wanted to come to you, Rich. Absolutely. Well, uh, just before I did, I know I could see Sarah had her hand up. So, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to say something on that. Well, Sarah, Sarah uh, was a, a questioner, uh, our first questioner, so it was my mistake. Um, Anthony will be our next. No, no, Sarah, Sarah Ellis. Oh, Sarah Ellis. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, yeah. no, I think Javad's point's really right, and I think that one thing we need to think about as, as we innovate out of this is that um, our 
our business models and our commercial systems can radically shift with the change that's going on and that with our audience of the future project we did do some testing around commercialization and there is an appetite to pay but it's how how you get people to pay and what they're paying for also is it is it the experience or is it something else and it's a really really interesting next, next step, step for us to yeah. look at I people, to, people to go to rich and then go to anthony because we're running out oh, of time. all Sorry good and that. thank you rich no. <laughs> yeah, right. well, I, I, was, I was just gonna i think build build on, on that and and just say i'm actually really optimistic about you know uh, uh people paying for content i think we're i think we're seeing a a pretty significant transition towards uh payment for content i think it's being led by the creator economy i think we're seeing it out of the gaming industry and i think mm -hmm. you know cultural institutions should really you know be aiming to think like a creator or think like some of these gaming studios or pod i think podcasting is a great example who are monetizing small passionate communities and i, I actually really feel optimistic about that model uh, for cultural institutions online right thanks i'm a podcast host so i appreciate that um uh, the one question i i wanted to ask <laughs> thank you javad uh what i what i wanted to ask rich is and i will jump to you uh, immediately anthony i promise i just wanted to ask rich one quick question these TikTok 60 second performances are absolutely phenomenal and i know that twitter actually extended the number of uh words that one could use in a tweet i wonder whether TikTok would ever consider making giving people a bit more time to express them so 60 seconds is a really really short time to to put on performance 60 seconds is pretty short. i mean you can you can live stream on TikTok and you can live stream for much longer yes. so so that's certainly possible and you know we're you know we're constantly looking at uh, you know all different elements of the product so you know perfectly possible that, that we could do that uh, uh, with okay. short as well great anthony please um sorry to keep you waiting and very uh, welcome to you thank you very much and thank you for the discussion um a quick question the pleasance we run a festival as part of the edinburgh fest a, a venue as part of the edinburgh festival um and we welcome people from all over the world which obviously last year and this year we cannot do we have for the last eight months been trying to develop a digital auditorium where you could have people on screen in the room and a, a, a live or a streamed audience as well to make sure that everybody felt as if they were part of it. It felt important to build this auditorium okay, around. Do you the have a question, Anthony, because we've only the, got five minutes left. The, the, the question is, it, well, there were two. The first one was that 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 we need to change the way in which we educate now young people and, and because there is a new language obviously developing. The main, my question is really about funding. You know, for small theatres, this is an impossibly huge task. Mm -hmm. and, and where is the funding going to come from? How are we going to find the colossal amounts of money this is going to take to change? Yeah, that is an important one. I don't know if Javad wants to uh, take a stab at that. Um, is this where I point to the huge piles of cash I've got hidden? <laughs> yes. In the corner of the dressal room. Yeah. Uh, uh, look, man, I mean, I think if I can be provocative, I think the first thing I would say is that a uh, question about where you get more money from is often uh, a different he question hidden as a question about money. Um, I think the question, you know, question about how, how you do that work whenever we make work as artists you know I, i've got a very small company that's not supported in an ongoing way i hope it will be soon by the arts council but at the minute it's not we all however big or small your institution don't have enough money and take risks when we do what we do the question is in the heart and in the gut like which one will you fight for of those risks do you know what i mean i think then we get into that broader question of funding i i i, I think look um there are this is this becomes a political question and i think that on the one hand there is um uh you know um a serious discussion to be had about about lobbying as uh, sarah's talked about before about trying to get our hands on the look uh trying to get our hands on the idea of like us being an important part of the social fabric of this country and upskilling people and so on and I think, to be honest, it's interesting to talk to, like, as I say, proper tech people on this chat as well, because one of the things we need to be sort of quite clear about is that it's very much, is, especially like me, if you come from a small organisation, there is often a disparity in terms of where knowledge is on stuff. You know, we don't, my company don't do super techie things. We basically get people to use WhatsApp. Do you know what I mean? That's just, you just, it's not a complete, I'm not coding anything. You just sort of do that. But like, you know, to be clear, like, 
in terms of people who have those skills, if you're interested in like working with coders or games, um, games designs are slightly different because they're as weird as artists often, but more sort of like straight techie people, you know, there's so much of a call for their skills that to have that level of knowledge and that training and want to come and play with artists and creatives often puts you in a minority. So I think um, if, uh, for me, if there is an ask to the more commercial sector, it's just about opening up those conversations, and you know, for better for worse, we have a we have a we have a, a way of funding arts from the government in this country, which is has a sense of, however imperfectly, has a sense of kind of competition and the sense of democracy to it. Um, definitely not perfect, you know. Definitely, it's the usual suspects usually, and I feel like that's not yet happening with perhaps our people from uh, the bigger, richer companies are coming and, and playing with us yet. So that's, that would be my final provocation on that. Okay, well, I'm allowed to add something. Yeah, we, we do need to, I don't know uh, okay, how much I can go over. Um, we've only I'll just say it in two seconds. Is I think just to add to that, we need to empower young people a lot more. They should be part of the conversation. The demographics of the world have shifted and young people should be able to feel like technology is their friend and not something that's going to be presented to them as uh, a platform as much as something that they can engage with. And that's what these sorts of accessible platforms are now doing. And I think that's going to help um, in terms of raising money and funding as well, because they're going to be part of the same network. Great, thank you so much. And I wanted to now, um, I don't know whether we have a, the poll, if we could just quickly show the poll before uh, we wrap up this conversation. So this is audience poll number two of these activities, which will you continue to do once the cultural sector finally reopens? Um, and I think, um, do we have the results of this poll or is it just presenting the poll once again to the audience? I'm not quite sure. Um, I think if we get those results, we will definitely. I will definitely share them with you. Otherwise, I was going to um, go back. Uh, yes, here we are. <laughs> we have the results of the poll, and um, well, good news for uh, good news for Daniel. Um, augmented reality and virtual reality have gone up. <laughs> uh, actually, they've almost doubled doubled in the case of virtual reality and uh, tripled in the case of augmented reality and uh, online performances are still at 72 percent and still lead so I think that the, the takeaway from this poll result the second poll uh, I'm going to have to go to Daniel on this and say what do you think Daniel that the audience decided that they actually were using three times more virtual reality than they thought in the beginning <laughs> Yeah, what should I say? I'm not surprised. No, I don't know what to say, actually. Um, you know, um, I think we all made a case for new technologies. And, uh, and uh, so I'm happy about that. And, um, you know, in a way, I think um, the future of the cultural sector and the art world that I know best, it's not going to be digital. It's not going to be virtual. It's going to be um, physical and virtual. And I think that's, you know, um, this... This conversation is already an example of it. We're all, you know, sitting in our spaces and and um, in our apartments or offices or whatever, but we're participating. And I think the, the international conversation must go on. I don't think that it should be, you know, that culture should should only be local. I have nothing against the, you know, initiatives that are super local, but I think, uh, you know, we're used to it being an international conversation. And um, these technologies, including relatively meager or visually meager um, platforms like Zoom, are part of it. And, you know, it, it's a year and a half later, we're getting used to this. We all look for real encounters. And, you know, what did I take away from this one and a half years? Well, definitely that I miss my friends and family and colleagues in the art world and all of that. But I think we're also, you know, we learned that there are a few other options and maybe that institutional structures actually can be developed. Thank you so much, Daniel, for doing my job and wrapping everything up so cleverly. <laughs> um, I would really like to say a huge, huge thank you to Rich, to Sarah, to Javad, to Suhair and to Daniel in the order that they appear on my Zoom screens. And to say a big thank you to all of our, uh, our audience um, of nearly of 300 people, I have to say, um, at the start of this program. And to say also uh, really thank, thank you on my behalf 
for uh, the uh, privilege of presenting this conversation. And I thank you very much. And I will now hand the baton over to the Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, Farah, thank you for being such a brilliant moderator. And thank you to everyone. And look, it's been a very rich conversation. As I discussed at the beginning, I have, um, you know, chair the Culture and Commerce Task Force. And I'm convinced, going back to Antti's question about the theatre and other things, commerce needs to get more involved in culture. That's where a lot of the funding is going to come from. And so here, coming from your point, the young are going to drive that because they aren't going to go and join firms that aren't thinking like that. Uh, and finally, Daniel, absolutely. Uh, it's physical and virtual. It's like the hybrid version that we're having here in the city. And here I am in the mansion house and it's Monday. Monday is the quiet day. You've got Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday that are getting busier. And as everyone keeps telling me, Wednesday is the new Thursday. Uh, so look, it's exciting times. And uh, but for me, as you know, I'm passionate about culture. Uh, and I thank you all for your insights uh, for a wonderful um, forum uh, and webinar. And thank you again. It's TikTok Evening Standard. I wrote up a musical alive in Wonderland. It's kind of like a giant metaphor for the pandemic, and I'm not gonna spoil it. But basically, I'm setting up a company locally, theatrically, but I'm kind of struggling financially. We want to produce our musical this year, but firstly, for free, here's some stuff about me. I'm 20, currently studying at June UC in MT with a level three degree in performing arts. It isn't too hard, but without this chance, my career won't kickstart. Kickstart a field, and I wanted to apply for an arts council loan, but then you came by. My friends suggested you'd be a breakout star with help like that. You're sure to go. Far. So I wrote this song and I wrote this tune I'm playing my piano in my own bedroom And I'm hoping you'll give me the chance For my musical dreams to advance My worries and strife will be done With my future theatre fund This story starts in a cell. It's a story of how the West's colonial nightmare of Islam came to life. A vision made vision and flesh. So some of this show happens on WhatsApp, which is why I've asked you to leave your phones on and join our WhatsApp group. But look, this show isn't about instant messaging or my love of memes. This show's about men, politics, and the internet. He finds a magazine called De Beer. De Beer makes him dizzy. Inside, he reads these articles that speak to a feeling he's been carrying around for months. That every new outrage, every nightclub attacked in Paris or a gay bar attacked in the States is part of a plan. A plan that will bring this world that torments and humiliates Muslims, that torments and humiliates him, to its knees. People are very critical of social media, but that's not my experience at all. About 12, maybe 13 months ago, I met um, a gay rabbi from Alabama on Facebook. I mean, let the problems in that man's life just briefly sink in. <laughs> stale smell of stale teenager staining the air in that comfortable Orange County bedroom. But there's a new president in the White House, one that Ethan and his brothers, well, kind of helped put there. Ethan sends messages, demands translations, links to news aggregators and right-wing news sites. Click send. All across Europe, people go to the polls. Muslim against non-Muslim, white against black. Sides are chosen, brotherhoods are chosen. And the gray zone and democracy begin to tumble. Ethan's work finds a waiting, willing audience.
was a ship that put to sea, the name of the ship was a bully of tea. The winds blew up her bow, dip down a blow, my bully boys blow. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. Climate change is the most significant and fastest growing threats to people and their heritage worldwide. So we're losing quite significant parts of our cultural heritage on a daily basis. Sea level rise, the desertification, all adversely impact heritage values. We are just custodians or keepers of these sites. To let our future generation know their past. We need the most advanced techniques to understand these buildings. SIRC uses a variety of technologies to create a highly accurate 3D model that can be used to generate architectural drawings. El uso de tecnologías digitales no invasivas permite tener modelos exactos de los sitios de qué lugares comenzar a abarcar en mediano plazo. They can come back in one, three, five years and monitor the erosion down to the millimetric level. The heritage is part of our life. It's part of our identity and it's what defines us. This heritage is the shared heritage of humanity and we have a duty to protect these sites for future generations. What do you guys want to be when you're older? I want to be a chef. I want to be a scientist. I want to be an actor. Yo, stick to basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever let somebody tell you, you can't do something. Yeah, but they're laughing at me. When people can't do something themselves, they're going to laugh. They're going to tell you you can't do something. Forget them. You keep working. You want to be an actor, right? Yeah, but I don't know where to start. You got a phone with a camera, right? Yeah. Well, do your own stuff. Put it online. But I need someone to play other characters. You can play all of them. What about location? Use a green screen. But who will edit all of that? I don't know how to do that. You can learn anything online, man. You know that. There's no excuses. Remember, it's never too late to be all that you could be. I'll come back in the class. <sighs> okay. Part three, scroll down.
one year before the crash. When the plane touches down in Dubai, Paribash squeezes Hussein's hand. This is her first time outside of Iran. She hasn't slept at all. Hussein wakes up slowly. He knocks the drinks holder with his knee. He's used to coming first class, but he didn't tell his parents this time, just snuck the tickets onto the credit card and came over. Scroll down. The hotel room is huge. Paribash takes a photo of the city skyline, making sure her manicured hand is just in shot. This is it, she thinks. She video calls her sister. She asks if her parents have gone to bed, Daria says they have. She shows Daria the room. Daria can't believe that she's not using a filter. Paravash asks if the liar she told her parents is holding up. Daria says it is. Paravash makes a promise to tell her if they begin to suspect anything. She hangs up and walks downstairs. The valet walks her to the hire car and the automatic door of a yellow Ferrari pops open. She steps in and offers Hussein a swig of champagne. 